Hi, my name is Andromeda, my pronouns are she, they, and today we'll be discussing the vibrant queer urban scenes which formed around the Weimar era. Queer urban scenes were important spaces where queer identities coalesced. Across the gay and lesbian nightclubs, bars, and social organizations of Berlin and other German cities, people interested in queer relationships acquired a sense of belonging and were given an opportunity to perform their identities through the clothes they wore, the language they spoke, the stories they shared, and the people they danced with. These scenes allowed for the formation of queer culture, community, and allowed for queer individuals to express their sexualities and gender identity amongst people who felt similarly. The Weimar Republic became famous for its relative openness with regard to sexuality and gender expression. The queer scenes of Berlin, Hamburg, Cologne, and elsewhere contributed significantly to the country's reputation for permissiveness. This included a number of bars, restaurants, cafes, and other meeting places for queer people alongside a growing network of social clubs and a relatively successful publishing industry. Germany's gay scenes expanded at a steady pace, offering opportunities to establish relationships, fashion identities, and pursue political projects. For many, Berlin's gay scene epitomized a world in transition, clubs full of men wearing powder and rouge, as well as short-haired women dressed in tuxedos, offered images of a world seemingly turned upside down. For Germany's gay men and lesbians, Berlin represented promise. Its gay scenes offered exciting places to hunt for love, happiness, and to find people who felt similarly. Christopher Isherwood, a gay British writer who moved to Berlin in 1930 to spend a couple of years teaching English and exploring the city's underworld, put it simply enough, Berlin meant boys. Isherwood's book, Goodbye to Berlin, based on his time there, eventually became the basis for the 1972 film Cabaret. Many believe Germany's capital city offered homosexual men and women some of the best opportunities for friendships and relationships. In fact, as early as the turn of the century, Berlin's gay scene was attracting such notoriety that it was frequently mentioned in tourist literature and other published portraits of the city. Berlin's gay scene was the most famous, but many other cities developed their own scenes. Their growth was promoted by the newspapers, magazines, and tourist guides, and other printed material of the era, which attracted attention to the scenes. Despite effort by the police to watch and limit the areas that gay men and lesbians gradually made their own, the gay scenes of Germany expanded steadily. In the midst of the rising nightlife of Berlin, a gay scene gradually took place. Even during the economic explosion of the 1860s and early 1870s, the police were aware that certain bars and clubs were attracting groups of homosexuals, though not yet exclusively. Also from this era, we have the first reports of homosexual masquerade balls. Initially organized informally among circles of interconnected friends, but formalized into regular events by the end of the century, Hirschfeld observed the city's gay balls as being a Berlin speciality in their kind and duration. Around 1880, the first bar to cater entirely to homosexuals opened. It was joined by many others over the next three decades, and there were nearly 40 by the beginning of World War I. The rapid growth of the city and its economy was a major contributing factor to the development of a gay scene in Berlin. 
Many sociologists and social historians have argued that the appearance of a massive urban environment unsettled traditional patterns of life, creating the possibility for new social relationships and identities to form. In this case, queer relationships and identities were made possible. As people moved into the cities, they escaped from the narrow confine and family pressures that so often dominated the environment of villages and even small towns. In large cities like Berlin, they found a degree of anonymity, making it easier for them to risk contacts. More importantly though, the sheer numbers of people made it more likely to find other gay men and women, and develop social networks of friendship that were largely based on same-sex desire. Additionally, the increasing numbers of printed material on homosexuality available in the last three decades of the 19th century played a part in fueling the development of Germany's gay scenes. With the rise of a mass-reading public, there was emerging interest in information on same-sex desire. For gay men, lesbians, and trans individuals, Berlin in particular had a lure that was difficult to resist. By the 1920s, it acquired a preeminent position in the minds of homosexual Germans, as well as a spot in a global network of queer cities, including Vienna, Paris, Rome, London, and New York. Those who went to Berlin had much to be impressed by. Hirschfeld estimated that between 90 and 100 gay bars could be found in the city by 1923, a number confirmed by other sources. Nearby the Friedrichstrasse district, one could find homosexual bars like the Marion Casino, the Schoenenvertel, the Café Nordstern, and the Adoni Diel. In the area around Nollendorf Platz, one could find a cluster of gay clubs, including the Nashalof, the Continental Club, the Bulo Casino, and the Dorian Gray. Not far from here was the most famous of the Weimar gay establishments, the El Dorado. By the turn of the century, a fair amount of diversity had developed between the bars. Magnus Hirschfeld, who is well acquainted with Berlin's scene, observed in his 1912 study that each bar had its special mark of distinction, that one is frequented by older people, that one only by younger ones, and yet another by older and younger people. There were larger clubs which offered singing, cabaret, and theater, whereas smaller ones focused more on giving queer people a chance to mingle among themselves, perhaps providing a piano player to offer entertainment. The establishments were divided by the social background of their clientele. Hirschfeld stated that there are bars for every social level, elegantly outfitted bars in which the cheapest drink is one mark, down to middle-class taverns where a glass of beer costs ten pennies. Hirschfeld emphasized the orderliness of most of the bars. Generally, the bartenders work to maintain a clean atmosphere. On Saturdays and Sundays, the bars were often packed beyond capacity. Music was common. As Hirschfeld wrote, piano players and singers, who are often called by feminine names, are generally popular, and like the waiters, who are often the partners of the owners, are smothered with compliments and friendly words by guests. Here, men and women felt comfortable enough to dance close to one another, as one man languished in the arms of his leading partner. Many of the chief attractions in Berlin and other German cities were the transvestite venues. By far the most famous was the El Dorado, a nightclub whose festive atmosphere 
attracted not only homosexuals, but also artists, authors, celebrities, and tourists, wanting to admire a piece of decadent Berlin, or even catch a glimpse of someone famous. The El Dorado even had coins featuring same-sex couples dancing together, which could be used to pay for dances. Lesbians could also be found in some of the bars that were devoted mostly to gay men. Hirschfeld remembered seeing lesbian couples frequently in the Bulo Casino. They were also often seen in the larger clubs of the 1920s, such as the Top and the El Dorado. The Dorian Gray, one of the oldest and best-known gay clubs of the Weimar era, had a special night set aside for women. By the turn of the century, there were also a handful of exclusively lesbian bars in the city. After the First World War, the number of lesbian clubs and cafes exploded, and by the mid-1920s, there were over 50 of them in the city. The atmosphere of these bars was generally refined, the lighting was soft, and sentimental music played in the background. One of the most famous was Chesma Belso on Marburger Strasse, decorated in Greek-style frescoes and furnished with private booths where couples could take refuge behind curtains. Many of the locals thought this mostly to be a showplace for tourists, however, and they preferred quieter and more subdued clubs such as the Mali and Jugal on Lutherstrasse where a thick black curtain blocked the view of the interior from the street. Many of the lesbian bars were segregated somewhat by class. There was the exclusive Club Montbijou West, open only by invitation, and the elegant Aramid, full of artists and celebrities. There were also bars for older patrons, cafes for prostitutes and their customers, and the Working Class Tavern. As Marty Liebeck states in her book Desiring Emancipation, many middle-class women were still quite worried about respectability in the 1920s, and advertisements for lesbian bars often went to great lengths to reassure the readers that their events were restrained and dignified. Berlin's various homosexual establishments became famous for the elaborate gay balls that they would throw on regular occasions. One French observer of the city around the turn of the century noted that gay balls were often held several times a week in different clubs during the festive season between October and Easter. On some nights, one could find more than one ball being held somewhere in the city. Although admittance tickets could be expensive, the events were still very well attended. At one New Year's ball that Hirschfeld went to, more than 800 people were counted. The rooms began to fill as the evening approached midnight. Some people were in suits or fancy dress, but many were in costume. Hirschfeld stated that a few appeared in masks that completely hid their faces. They came and went without anyone having an idea who they were. Others left their cocoons approximately at midnight. Not a few of the men were dressed in women's clothing. One visitor from South America had on a Parisian dress that cost him a small fortune. Wealthy gentlemen would take the occasion to show off a bit, arriving in elaborate dresses and being greeted with much fanfare. Very often, they would show up and act like women the entire night, despite sporting a dashing mustache or even a full beard. Sometimes, though, the costumed men could be even more convincing. Hirschfeld recalled that on one particular evening, one of the men in the crowd put on such a successful performance at being a woman 
that he fooled a police officer who had attended to make sure that things did not get out of hand. After two hours of parading and dancing, the time for coffee came. Long tables were pulled out, and everyone took a seat. Female impersonators danced and sang some humorous songs. And then the evening resumed, as before, and everyone stayed until morning. Lesbians could sometimes be found at male gay balls, and lesbian bars held their own balls. These occasions were different from those of their male counterparts, not only in terms of costume, but also generally in their excluding of men entirely. The most exclusive ball in the pre-war period was a private party, open only to those with an invitation, arranged by a prominent Berlin lady. Normally it took place in the ballroom of one of the city's grand hotels. Couples would arrive beginning at 8 in the evening, costumed as monks, sailors, clowns, boas, Japanese geishas, bakers, and farmhands. They would sit down to eat at tables lined with flowers, and the director, dressed in a gay velvet jacket, would greet guests and give a small speech. After dinner, the tables would be put away and the orchestra would begin playing waltzes and other lively dancing music, while the couples would dance throughout the night. In a nearby room, others would drink, make toasts, and listen to singing. One female participant remarked, No bad moods cloud the universal joy, including those of the last woman participants who leave the place at the dawn's early light into the cold February morning. It is a place where among people who feel the same way, they could dream for a few hours about being who they are inside. While Berlin acquired an international reputation for its gay scene, it was not the only German city where gay men and lesbians were seeking places to meet. The port city of Hamburg, with its large migrant worker population, many sailors coming in from the sea, and its infamous red light district of St. Pauli, had a lively scene. One author described Hamburg in 1897 as the German city most troubled by Uranians, estimating that every fourth man who walked along the main shopping street of the city was gay, and another six bisexual. Although clearly exaggerated, he was not alone in remarking about the city's reputation as a gay scene. Most of Hamburg's gay bars in the early 20th century were located right in the downtown area, especially in the entertainment district that developed in St. George. One of the first gay bars of the city was called, in a reference to Frederick the Great, who is widely believed to have been gay, the King of Prussia. At the turn of the century, it was the only club in the city where men dared to dance openly with one another. But by the 1920s, it had closed down, but was replaced by many others. There was the Casino on Rosenstrasse and the Tolsken on Eisterdam. The Rheingold Restaurant and Café on Lilienstrasse advertised itself as a comfortable location for both male and female friends that offered musical entertainment and dancing. The most popular of Hamburg's gay bars was the Three Stars, located on Hutenstrasse. Another city with a major gay scene was Hanover. Even though it was smaller, homosexual men and women could still find places to meet. Probably the earliest of these places was the Ballhof on Bergstrasse. Beginning around 1919, the ballroom specialized in bringing Berlin-style gay balls to Hanover. 
one of the city's local gay celebrities, the female impersonator Friedel Schwartz, entertained audiences on its cabaret stage. Another attraction was Wilja, another well-known and very effeminate gay man in the city. Besides dancing and watching performances, one could buy some of the gay magazines of the day in this establishment. The building was in bad shape, though, and by 1922 it had closed down, though it was quickly replaced by others. There was the Black Cat Café on Windmühlenstrasse, and the National Café on Nordmannstrasse. The German-Jewish philosopher Theodore Lessing, who was born and raised in Hanover, described a gay bar apparently known on the streets as the Gay Appetite, where lesbians and gay men gathered to dance. For a brief period in the early 1930s, Hanover had its own El Dorado, which apparently tried to attract lesbians, as it was advertised in one of Weimar era's lesbian magazines. It was only open for about six months, though. More well-liked was the Neustadter Guesthaus, which took over the job of hosting gay balls after the Ballhof closed down. Despite the availability of bars that exclusively served lesbians and gay men, one of the most popular places continued to be an establishment with a mixed audience, the Continental Café. In the western region of Germany, known as the Rhineland, both Köln and Dusseldorf possessed active scenes. In Köln, there were several gay bars which opened after the war. The Dahlhaus restaurant on Hannenstrasse was one of the first. By 1920, it was the meeting place for a local friendship club that put on a regular cabaret night for members on Sundays. Nearby was the Nettesheim Casino, a favorite place to go dance. Here one could also buy some of the homosexual publications that were available on the Weimar market. By the mid-1920s, though, the most popular gay nightclub in the city was the Sleeping Beauty, a transvestite cabaret with entertainment provided by Tilla and Ressi. Placed on the tables in the club were telephones that could be used to call men at neighboring tables to dance as depicted in the film Cabaret. In Dusseldorf, restaurants such as the Tivoli and the Dama began to attract a homosexual clientele after the First World War. Bergestrasse, a street located near the Old Town District, became an important focus of the scene in the early 1920s, when the restaurant Arkari and on the other side of the street, Mombors, opened up. The latter was especially popular. Besides dancing and music, the bar became known early on for its cabaret performances that featured transvestites such as Hubertina. By the early 1930s, it was joined by other establishments scattered around the city. There was the Lettmans on Kolnestrasse and the Little Cornflower on Mintroplatz the Schmalbach Inn on Hohenstrasse and the Reinhardt restaurant on Brückenstrasse became known as some of the more intimate locations where it was easier to develop a relationship. In contrast, southern Germany was much less hospitable. Munich's police showed little of the tolerance exhibited by their counterparts in Berlin, Hamburg, Hanover, Köln, and other German cities with queer scenes, so gay establishments were hard to find in this region of Germany. While Weimar Germany was famous for its relative permissiveness in relation to sexuality and gender expression, it didn't come without policing. Though the police often did not interfere with these queer urban scenes, by the end of the 19th century, Many large cities had established homosexual squads, called homodesernat, 
but began to watch Germany's gay scenes closely. Since at least the mid-19th century, many criminal police units had kept lists of known homosexuals. Today, these lists are often colloquially known as pink lists, but at the time, they were often called pederast lists. Towards the end of the 19th century, these lists were formalized into extensive criminal files and rogues galleries of known homosexuals, all organized on index cards that included basic personal information and to which were attacked pictures and fingerprints. While doing little with this information, these lists were of course weaponized by the Nazis when they came to power in the 1930s. In short, queer urban scenes were monumental in establishing the environment which allowed queer relationships and identities to coalesce. And Berlin, in particular, became famous for its vibrant gay scene. Berlin was the most well-renowned, and attracted people from all over the globe. But many of Germany's larger cities possessed queer scenes. Though monitored, these scenes were rarely interrupted, allowing them to flourish up until the rising conservatism of the late 1920s and early 30s. In the next video, we'll look further into the queer culture of Germany at the time by exploring queer networks and friendship clubs. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned some valuable queer history, and I'll see you all in the next video.